Greetings. Uh, my name is Rob McBain. I'm one of the vascular specialists at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. And today we're going to talk about a very interesting topic, fibromuscular dysplasia. I have three very renowned experts at the table who know this disease well. On my far right, I have Dr. Tom Rook, vascular medicine at, at Mayo Clinic Rochester. Dr. Sanjay Misra, who is one of our interventional uh, colleagues and uh, has a big experience in uh, catheter-based therapies for this disease. And Dr. Iftikhar Kalu, who has a strong research in vascular disease and uh, specifically fibromuscular dysplasia. We're excited to see you all here today. My first uh, uh, question will be to Dr. Tom Rook, and I'd like to ask Tom, tell us about fibromuscular dysplasia. What is this disease? It's gaining a lot of press lately. Who gets it? What is it? Uh, how would you classify this unusual entity? Well, well it is an unusual entity, and I'm, I'm probably going to let people down by not being able to give folks um, all the answers at this stage. It's one, of, uh, it's, it's one of the mysteries we still have in vascular medicine. As best as we can tell, fibromuscular dysplasia is, is probably um, a, a congenital condition. Um, something that uh, you're born with but uh, doesn't become necessarily manifest until we get older in life. We used to, we used to think of it as always being a disease of young people, but uh, uh, as, as we'll probably talk about, that's, that's uh, changing a little bit. The, there are basically several types of fibromuscular dysplasia. Uh, the most common is medial dysplasia, which affects, of course, the medial layer of the, of the arteries and uh, uh, results in uh, abnormal arrangements of the blood cell, uh, of the uh, smooth muscle that can lead us then to stenotic lesions, aneurysms, uh, dilatations, a variety of problems. And it's these changes in the artery that uh, ultimately get people into trouble. Very good. Thank you so much. Now, 90% or thereabout <laughs> of patients who have fibromuscular dysplasia are women. Uh, Iftikhar Kalu, can you tell me, please, do you have any sense of why women seem to be overrepresented in this disease entity? Rob, again, I, we really don't know fully why uh, there's such a strong predilection. It's been shown in multiple uh, studies, um, and there has been this humoral hypothesis that perhaps some of the manifestations clinically uh, or presentation of these patients is related to hormones um, and, and uh, support of in, this, uh, in this regard is from the studies that show uh, that uh, these individuals have also a high incidence of having taken hormone replacement therapy. But going against the humoral hypothesis is that um, uh, pregnancy, for example, doesn't seem to necessarily exacerbate uh, FMD and that parity, for example, is not associated with a higher rate of uh, FMD. So it's an intriguing um, observation, uh, and as yet, uh, it's not clear why uh, women are more prone. I, I suppose there may be an interaction of uh, the genetic uh, variants, susceptibility variants, with uh, gender that then leads to the manifestation of the disease in women. But we fully don't understand this very strong predilection in women. Very good, thank you. Dr. Misra, tell us, you've done a lot of invasive studies on patients with FMD. You, you read cross-sectional CT and uh, ultrasound, et cetera. Is there any evidence that fibromuscular dysplasia gets worse over time? Is this a disease that progresses, or do you think, uh, as uh, Dr. Rook mentioned, that we're born with it, and what we have at birth or what we have in adolescence is what we have? That's a great question. I think it's complicated. We've seen people that are 80 that have FMD and atherosclerosis involving the renal arteries. And then conversely, we've seen nine-year-olds and 10-year-olds with it. So I, I, I like uh, what Tom says. I think it's probably congenital, although it's hard to know. We've looked at 2,600 CAT scans for patients that had donated kidneys and found a small incidence of renal artery FMD. And so we know people have it, we know people have it, and they don't know they have it. And we also know we've seen it in all the ages from 10s all the way up to 80s and 90s. So I think it's really interesting. I can tell you we've looked at our own database from the Olmsted Registry, uh, the Epidemiology Registry here, to understand how many FMDs are in Olmsted County 
and what the prevalence is. And over the last 20 years, the prevalence, the point prevalence is going up. And we're looking at this to understand the natural history. What happens once you get it? Do you get managed? How do you get managed? And what are the ramifications of the management? Do you go to procedures or do you do fine with medications, et cetera? So it's a big mystery that remains unsolved. Uh, Tom, as, as Sanjay has recently published and others have shown that perhaps as many as 4% of the general public may have this disease, on one end of the spectrum we see patients who present with dissections, renal infarction, stroke, and on the other hand we have these patients who don't have any symptoms. I mean, it, what is your sense? Is this a benign disease or is it something, where, where, where does this fall on the scale of serious diseases, do you think? Well, it, it certainly can be serious. That's the, that's the problem here. Uh, I think that there's a general agreement that the vast majority of FMD is benign, asymptomatic, doesn't cause problems. That's, that's probably true of almost anything that causes um, uh, mild stenotic or mild uh, dilatations in, uh, in arteries. The problem is that we haven't yet learned how to predict who's going to develop problems with this and who isn't because when the problems occur they can be absolutely catastrophic and those are the ones, those are the patients that typically are showing up on our doorsteps are the ones who, who have symptoms uh, either related to stenotic lesions that uh, make things ischemic or to aneurysms that uh, um, cause the problems typical of aneurysms or dissections. Those are the folks that, uh, that we're seeing. It's a small number, but it's, it's uh, biasing our view of this. And along that line, uh, in recent months and years, a, a specific, very specific disease called segmental arterial mediolysis, a disease of dissections, which at least on angiographic and on CT imaging looks like FMD but behaves very malignantly with dissections and infarctions. Are these the same diseases or do you <laughs> think that these are different? Is this just one manifestation on a spectrum or where do you think? Yeah, thank uh, you, Rob. That's a, that's a bit of a curveball there because this is one of the great, uh, great controversies that those of us that uh, see these patients and have to wrestle with these questions don't really know right now. I had a I had a, a great mentor years ago, actually um, one of the interventional radiologists who used to tell me that, that uh, well, you, you can easily tell a difference between FMD and, and SAM, S-A-M, because FMD never dissects and SAM does, and that's, that's it. You know, if it dissected well, then by definition it's, it's SAM. The answer is we, we really don't know yet what these subtle differences in, in the dysplastic components or the localization of the the, the disease is that leads to the clinical differences that we see in things like FMD versus SAM. But uh, it's all part of this ongoing effort that's, uh, that's picking up steam nationally to try to uh, learn more about these conditions. Very good, thank you. Now I'm gonna turn the uh, mic and the question back to Dr. Kalu. In the National Registry, a number of <laughs> patients had a history of tobacco exposure. Right. A number of patients, of course, had hypertension, and you might say that's simply uh, related to the renal artery uh, manifestations of FMD. A number of patients had dyslipidemia. Is this uh, atheros how does this relate to atherosclerosis? Is this just a sample bias? Do you think these risk factors have any relevance to this disease? Uh, that's a very interesting question. I would say that uh, by definition, FMD is supposed to be a bland arteriopathy without any inflammation and without any atherosclerosis. Um, having said that, um, in fact, y y there's interesting um, association between, for example, risk factors and dysplastic or aneurysmal disease. As you know, diabetics are protected against aneurysms, particularly abdominal aortic aneurysms. And, sir, and some say that even uh, higher lipid levels may not uh, necessarily predispose to aneurysms. But so there's this um, dichotomy of how risk factors behave towards FMD. The only Perhaps uh, observational um, finding of merit here is that there's a higher incidence of uh, prevalence of smoking, and that may perhaps uh, in some way contribute to either the development or uh, progression. But um, by definition, FMD is not atherosclerotic, and so we will have to look at other risk factors, uh, you know, whether they're genetic or humoral or others that we don't, mechanical, for example. 
Uh, but certainly, as Sanjay pointed out, uh, you're seeing these 80-year-olds. So uh, I think that's a very interesting area where people will have both. As you know, as we discover more of these individuals, we would have in the, uh, patients that have both the FMD and atherosclerosis. But I would say that um, the the by definition, uh, FMD would be free of atherosclerotic disease. Now I want to move uh, very briefly to treatment, and I want to first talk about medical treatment, and my questions then will be to you two, and then uh, I want to move into interventional treatment. Can I, Rob, can yeah, I inter yeah, please. Uh, interject? So I think it's interesting, when we looked at renal interventions done in Rochester, Scottsdale, and Jacksonville, we looked at about 1,500 renal angioplasties and stents. In that group of patients, about 10% had ASO and FMD, and I think that's forgotten. When we talk about intervention, we have some data on how does FMD behave in the older group versus the younger group, angioplasty versus not angioplasty. So I'll reserve that for uh, once we get there. But I think it's interesting they behave differently. Very good. Thank you. So, Tom, if you see a patient with FMD, how are you going to manage that individual, uh, knowing that typically these are young uh, women who may or may not have had any symptoms? What, what is your recommendations going to be? Well, I, I think the, the first thing that drives your recommendation is the presence or absence of symptoms. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if a patient is ha the, the two most common areas that we're going to find the disease is going to be in the renals and in the carotids, where it turns out it's probably close to an equal uh, distribution. Um, the, th if the renal disease is symptomatic, you certainly can treat it with uh, conservative medical therapy, meaning if the patient is hypertensive, you can put them on standard antihypertensives and use all the same rules that we use for atherosclerotic renal disease, um, meaning that if you can control a disease with medication, uh, you're doing okay. I always have a little bit of um, uh, of, of trouble with that approach because so many of these people are young and you're, you're committing them to uh, you know, a lifetime of medication when, when at least traditionally we've thought of this as being something that uh, can be managed a little easier than other vasculopathies and I'm sure Sanjay is going to want to talk about that a little more. The issue with uh, carotid disease or extracranial um, uh, cerebrovascular disease is a little, a little bit more problematic because we don't have mm -hmm. as good a medical therapy uh, for that disease. So if the patient is symptomatic, we're often looking at some type of, uh, of interventional treatment. I guess in deference to Iftikhar, I also have to point out that I treat people with FMD as, as if it were a risk factor for developing atherosclerosis down the road. I don't know that that's true. But I, I automatically move them in my mind to a higher risk category so that uh, I'm a little more aggressive and liberal with the aspirin and the statins and some of the other things that I might uh, put people on with, uh, with other higher grade risk factors. Very good, thanks. So the standard mantra in patients who, are res who have FMD who's, who are getting intervened upon endovascularly is to do angioplasty without stenting. Can you comment upon that, uh, yeah. Dr. Mizra? So I think, Rob, that's, a, that's been our mantra for so, as long as I've known it. You know, we angioplasty. I will say there is a group of patients, especially when you get in the sixth <coughs> and seventh decade, that angioplasty failures occur much faster than they do for a 20-year-old or 30-year-old. I think angioplasty is probably safe in this group. It's not like atherosclerotic F, uh, disease where you run the risk of more dissections and other you know, embolization, for example. So I think, you know, for young patients, symptomatic, hypertensive, FMD uh, with angioplasty works very well. When you get in the sixth, seventh, eighth decade, it fails. We wrote a paper on that, and there's a high risk of failure as you get older. And that's unclear why that is. We just have a couple of uh, seconds left, and I just want uh, each, each of you final comment, uh, research, future research on this disease, Dr. Kalu. Yeah, I, I think that there's a whole lot we don't know as has as probably come out in this discussion, and I, I, I think one area that we really need to understand better is the genetic basis of the disease, and that those are some activities that are ongoing here at Mayo and elsewhere. Very good. Dr. Misra. I like to understand better the natural history. You know, mm -hmm. Once you're diagnosed, what happens? You know, are you at risk for aneurysms? What is that percentage so we can better 
counsel our patients. Very good. Dr. Yeah, the natural history is clearly our, our big weakness right now. Unfortunately, there is a registry that's out there. They've begun to publish uh, since last year some of their data on this, and I'm, I am cautiously optimistic that uh, as we follow this registry over time, we're going to be able to understand more about the natural history and, and from that uh, what we ought to be doing about this disease. Well, uh, this is, thank you all. There's, there's, there is so much to talk about. There are many uh, avenues that we haven't had time to, to, to broach with this uh, discussion, and we, I think we could go on and on for a, at least another hour. But, for, uh, but I would like to thank each of, our, uh, each of our discussants, and I would like to thank you, the listening audience, for, for uh, watching uh, in on this very dis interesting uh, roundtable. And I would like you to um, continue to follow uh, us at the heart.org uh, for our roundtable discussions. I'd welcome that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob.